So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Tara Moran. I'm a librarian at the Mastic Maritza Shirley Community Library. And tonight's program, um, we're very happy to have from the National Park Service, Pat, uh, Pat, Ranger Pat Riley, who will be discussing winter birding on Fire Island and in your backyard. Now, if you have any questions throughout this pro program, please enter them in the chat box. We will have time at the end to an answer questions. Um, but if your question has to deal with whatever Pat's talking about, she'll, she could get to it right then, or of course, we'll save it to the end. So Pat, if you're ready, please go ahead and tell us all about our birds. Okay, and we've had some really good bird sightings, first of all, on Fire Island in the last few weeks. So I'll talk about that in a minute, but I'm gonna share a PowerPoint and we're gonna do some basic birding. Um, Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Not yet. You can't, oh wait, hang on. Okay, we can see that now? Yes. Okay, and I can see you, Tara, so I can see you nodding, so that's yeah. good. Um, and yeah, somebody couldn't see it before, but that's okay. All right, so the basics of birding. I am not uh, an expert birder. I'm sort of a little, maybe above average birder. I have experience um, in backyard birding as well as uh, doing bird programs on Fire Island. So what I'm going to talk about is, I mean, it's winter birding, it's backyard birding, but it's really basics. It's really basics. Um, I want to thank the library for having me this evening. Um, and we're going to talk about the great backyard bird count, which comes up this month. Every February, all around the world, people count birds. And there's lots of programs. Fire Island has one. Uh, the library has a couple where you can participate. And this is all citizen science, where data that you go out and, you know, if you see a bird and you uh, report it, it's recorded and, and everybody knows around the world where the birds are, which is pretty exciting. And it helps scientists better understand the, the global bird, bird population, um, bird migration, the Cornell Lab of uh, Ornithology uh, runs this and there are online uh, apps and phone apps that you can use to participate. And so we'll talk about a little, little about that at the end. Um, but getting started, um, a couple of tools. So a field guide. There are many, many field guides, bird books. I'm sure you can get one from the library. Um, but they're all fairly, um, they're all useful. What can I say? They're all very, very useful. Um, binoculars, binoculars are really good to have. Um, binoculars of any type, hang on, my dog is barking and I'm gonna try to mute that for a second until she stops. Hang on one sec, okay. Barking stopped, sorry about that. So binoculars of any strength, any sophistication, you can spend, you know, $20, you can spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on binoculars. Um, out at Fire Island, we have a spotting scope, which is way stronger. It's something like a telescope that we use that, and we share with visitors. So if you ever come down to the Wilderness Visitor Center over the bridge, you can come and look at anything. We look at everything through our spotting scope. And, and the third thing is get outside. You can be at your own window looking at birds. Um, you can come over to the beach. You can go to a park. Uh, there's birds everywhere. So, the first thing to do is to become familiar with the birds in your area. Where are you and what are the usual suspects? Okay, there's some things that you might see a bird that looks like a penguin. I had some kids tell me they found a penguin. It wasn't a penguin because we don't expect to see that here. Um, a lot of times a field guide helps you narrow down what what you might expect to see, or if there's a particular bird and you think you know what it is, um, 
once in a once in a while we get what what are called vagrants which are birds that appear they're way off course they're you know they're blown by a storm and they can be totally out of the region we expect them to be uh, but but there's certain birds we expect to see and that's what we're going to look for and we want to learn the gist and we either call it gist or gist and so either way you want to explain it or say it um, gist is the main point or the essence of something, the gist of a story or the gist of this program. But the acronym GIST is has the same meaning, general impression of size and shape. And so either of these things, it's birding by impression. Um, a big, big white bird you see flying overhead with a long neck, good guess it's a swan. So there's a lot of things you can just sort of get an idea of. You may not know a particular subspecies, but you'll know in general what kind of bird we're, we're seeing. So here are some of the birds you might expect to see. We see them on Fire Island. You probably see them in your backyard. So I'd love to see a show of hands or um, there's a, I don't know if we have a raise hand, but um, do you know, all, can you identify all these birds? Um, these are all fairly common birds you'd expect to see on Long Island on the South Shore year round, especially in the winter at a bird feeder. So uh, what we've got here on the far left is a mockingbird, northern mockingbird, a uh, very common bird. These, the, all the birds we see on the screen now are similar in size. The one on the right is a little bit bigger, but the one on the left is about the same size as the ones in the middle. So the one on the left is a mockingbird. Um, most of you have probably heard of it. They are gray sort of everywhere. You see them everywhere on your feeders in the trees. The birds in the center are, um, are probably most common bird feeder visitors at this time of year. And uh, they're both northern cardinals. And here we get to one of the complications of birding, which is the male and the female look different. They look here, they're a different color. They're the same size and shape. The male is the one on the left, which is bright red with the black around its beak. The one on the right is a female. So they're sort of olive brown colored with, with some red on their wings and tail. So about the same size, quite different color. Their, and their color doesn't change. So here's a, it's, a, it's another complication to birding is sometimes birds have a different color in the winter than they do in the summer. So our cardinals, our Northern cardinals look pretty much the same year round, very easy to identify and, and fairly common to see. And the bird on the right is a very, very, um, well-known blue jay. So a blue jay uh, is a little bit bigger than the other birds. Again, common in our gardens, even on Fire Island, but you'll see them at the bird feeder. Uh, so these are all, let's, you know, we start simple. This is, can you identify these birds? Good. That's three species. And the blue jay and the mockingbird, the male and the female are the same. So now we, we can identify four different birds in three species. So we now let's get to a bird that you may or may not have seen. Oh, here's some more, sorry. These are the IDs of what we just went over. Um, here's another bird that you may get a glimpse of. Um, it's the biggest bird you'll see that looks anything like this, biggest, large dark bird. You might see it over the Carmen's River. Not so much on Fire Island, though they do visit. And we see in this photo, it's got a white tail. So if you, if you know that we have these in the area, you'd know this is a bald eagle. So bald eagles are not common. You won't see one every day like you would a blue jay perhaps but they're not uncommon either. And they do nest in the Wertheim Wildlife Refuge. So they're around. Um, it's a little deceiving sometimes because the juveniles, until they're a couple of years old, they don't have the white tail and head. 
So if you see a totally dark brown bird, um, really the only bird that's this size is the bald eagle. And one of the things that you can't see in this photo is they have a huge beak. And that's really, really distinctive. Um, you wouldn't mistake it for a goose, which might have a longer neck. So uh, these are lo these nest locally in the winter. Some northern bald eagles might come into the area. The size of them, though, is if you were to stretch your arms out, if you're, okay, I'm not six feet tall. If you're six feet tall and stretch your arms out to the sides, that's six, that's six feet. And their wingspan is about that big. So that's a really big bird. Um, they mate for life. They live 15 to 25 years. And um, you may know that in the 60s, they were near extinction. This is a really good recovery story um, that due to uh, DDT, they were not, the eggs were not viable. They were disappearing. There were some left in the far north but they were, they were removed from the threatened species list in 2007. So since 2007, they're considered, um, they're not in danger of extinction, extinction, which is really good. Okay, there it is. There's your bald eagle. Um, now you can see the white head. You can see it's got level, straight level wings. The Beak is huge. The beak on, a, on a, a bald eagle is like no other birds. It's big, strong, yellow beak. And um, another thing to note is the tips of the wings. If you notice, the feathers are separated. So you get the, the finger-like um, look to the ends of the wings. So all these should be able to help you identify a bald eagle. Okay, but there's some other big black, birds or big dark birds we see. So the one on the left is a bald eagle. I can't really, this is not a great photo to see whether it's got a white head or not. We can see that enormous yellow beak, but the bird on the right is different. Um, it doesn't have the big yellow beak. It doesn't have the white head and tail, but what you might see from a great distance is the fact that the wings are held in a V. So that V-shaped wing will tell us this is a turkey vulture. So I don't know if you've seen a turkey vulture around. Um, they're most commonly seen flying over the highway. If you drive out toward Riverhead, um, there's more out there than there are closer to us. Uh, but again, big, it's almost as big as an eagle. Uh, but the wings are, if you saw it from a great distance, you'd see they're more V-shaped. So, but we're gonna, here's, okay, so here's a better picture of the turkey vulture. It's also called a buzzard. Um, they've only been on Long Island for the last 10 years or so. They were very common upstate New York. You might've seen them over the New Jersey Turnpike, but they, they just started to come out to Long Island in the last 10 years. So there's a, these are some really good pictures of it. Um, but again, like I put in my notes, just to add to the confusion, here's another big black bird. So it's got level wings, so you might think it's an eagle, but the wingtips are white. And you probably would not see this near the water. Eagles are, are fisher birds. They actually, one of their main sources of food is fish. So they're usually near a river. They're on the shores of the uh, Great South Bay. This bird, they've actually been seen in Riverhead on one of the schools fairly recently. And this is a black vulture. So it's a little bit different than the turkey vulture. The level wings are the clue. So if you go back to the turkey vulture and you look at that right-hand photo here, you can see the V-shaped wings. Um, while the black vulture, not a great picture because it's taken from quite a distance. And it also has some white uh, near its wings. So these are really fun birds to see. They are the biggest ones you'll see. Um, and it's always exciting to see an eagle, I think. So here are some of our summer birds. Um, 
these birds have gone in the most part south for the winter. Occasionally, I have seen, I saw an osprey in, um, in December a couple of years ago, and I think I have them named here. So uh, wood thrush is a forest dwelling bird. It's maybe the size of a robin. And they're usually not seen in the winter. They're more summer, um, summer birds. Osprey is that bird in the center. Again, these were um, near extinction in the 1960s, and it's a great success story. We have lots of osprey. I'm sure most of you have seen an osprey, and we see them flying over Fire Island all the time. They are fish eaters, and um, some interesting things about them, they can dive up to about four feet into the water, so they really dive from a height. They hover which means they sort of flap their wings and stay in place until they spot a fish in the water. They dive in claws first and they, they can actually grab the fish with their claws. And when they come out of the water, they shake themselves off, they fly along and they adjust the fish in their talons so that it's more aerodynamic. So the fish, if you ever see an osprey flying with a fish in its talons, the fish is front to back. And that's how they carry them for to make it easier to fly. And they'll they will take them back to their nest uh, to eat them. And lots of osprey nest platforms have been built along the Carmen's River. They prefer trees. So um, when we're near the water and there's not a lot of trees, a lot of people have kindly put up these lovely um, sort of the height of a telephone pole, uh, a post with a flat surface at the top. And osprey like a big nesting platform like that. If they can't find anything else, they will nest on the ground. We have a ground nest in Brookhaven Hamlet where I live. So the osprey actually nest on the ground more often on these platforms. And um, if you're interested, there are cameras. And I know there's one in Patchogue on Main Street because there are a couple of osprey nests. There's a platform that's built over near the Brickhouse Brewery. It's a, a proper osprey platform, but there's a couple of um, cell phone towers in Patchogue that have osprey nests. So it's very interesting if you drive along the highway and sort of look up uh, at um, any big tower, you might see a, a bunch of sticks up on the top of a tower and that's most likely an osprey nest so um that's pretty interesting right now they're all down around brazil for the winter and they'll come back in the summer to nest and the birds on the right are piping plovers they are down in the sort of northern caribbean gulf coast of florida uh cuba puerto rico at this time of year um they are also seasonal visitors. I think next month we're doing a program all about piping plovers, but we expect them to come back to Fire Island probably next month. We're about a month away from seeing piping plovers on the beach. And um, I hope you tune in next month to learn all about those, but they're migrants as well. So we also have birds these, all, these birds migrate away and they go south. We have northern birds that, that uh, migrate here. So in the winter, I think I have a diagram. Wow, okay, this is really busy, but it gives us an idea. If you look on the right-hand side of the map, those red lines, we have, it's called the Eastern Flyway. A lot of migrant birds follow the coast. Um, they may nest in the Arctic, and they come to our area this time of year. Others um, migrate from our area south in the, um, further south in the winter, but why do they migrate? It's mostly to find food. So sometimes when there's a shortage of food in the Arctic, let's say, we get, uh, a special kind of uh, migration. And I think I have the word on the next screen. There we go. It's called an eruption. So sometimes when there are, there's an overpopulation of birds, 
They mar migrate further south to expand their range. They don't wanna be too close together because if they're all trying to find the same kind of food, they need to spread out a little. It's like you go to the buffet, you can't all stand by the salad. Everybody's gotta move and, and sort of spread out. So um, we may see some less common birds in larger numbers than usual. What we do have, and I, I may have a picture of it coming up, there has been an eruption. There was one maybe six years ago, and this year we're seeming to see a lot of snowy owls. And it's not that they are starving and searching for food, it's that they are, there is so much food that they've, the population has had a sort of a population explosion and there's more snowy owls and they're coming a little further south. Again, so that they can each have their own range and find enough food. So birds we might see on Fire Island in the winter. Um, ducks, there are a lot of ducks. These are migrants, many of them we only see in the winter. Some we might see all year round. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So um, the, the names are on the side. The green headed uh, bird up on the upper left is a mallard. Most of us have seen mallards. They're here year round. These are one of these confusing species where the male and the female are very different. So the male mallard is really easy to identify. And it's got sort of that buffy belly, a little bit of brown on the chest and that very green head. The female's a little less remarkable. And the female mallard looks a lot like the female of, of other duck species. They all kind of look brown. Um, the buffle head is the lower right. And that is, again, the male and female are quite different. They both have that sort of round head, a little different shape than the mallard, which you're probably more familiar with. Um, but the, the buffalehead male, the, it's hard to tell in this picture, his head is also sort of dark green with that huge white patch on the back, while the female just has sort of white cheeks. Um, the greater scop, so that is that bird on the upper right. They're fairly common in the bay, um, dark head and chest. And the female, again, looks nothing like the male, looks very much like a mallard female, maybe a little bit darker. If you saw a female mallard and a female scop next to each other, um, the scop would look a little bit darker. And the last one is the black duck. And if you look at it, it's actually dark green. It's not exactly black. And the female is a little bit lighter than that. Um, they have a little different color beak. So the bill um, of the male is yellow while the female has a dark green bill. So that's totally confusing. And now I was really confused. I had what I thought was a mallard under my bird feeder in my backyard, but it didn't look quite like a mallard. And it wasn't until I did a little research and found that black ducks and mallards can interbreed and create hybrids that look a little bit like both. So birding is challenging. It's really fun if you go with somebody who knows a little more than you do, um, like one of the birding programs that we're, we're gonna set up. And there's a lot of information online where you can look at pictures of black ducks um, side by side with pictures of mallards and pictures of all the different hybrids that they have. So um, it, it, it's challenging, but it's really fun to do. Um, we have large water birds too. These are some of the bigger uh, waterfowl that we'll see. On the left, um, you probably, everybody probably recognizes a mute swan. Mute swans are the only swans we have in our waters. Um, they are mute. You don't hear them honking or you might hear them hissing. Uh, they're very uh, interesting to hear fly overhead because their wings make a noise. So that's really fun. And um, they were actually um, introduced. They are not native to New York, so they don't uh, enjoy some of the same protections we have for our native birds. The white bird with the shorter neck is a snow goose. 
These are visitors from the Arctic. We do see them from time to time in the winter here. They come south um, to our waters, again, looking for food and um, pretty distinctive. They're, they're much shorter neck and different kind of bill than the swan, but it's the only totally white uh, waterfowl that you might see. On the right, uh, well, the third from the left, I guess, is a Canadian goose or Canada goose. You probably recognize these. They're very, very common. Uh, unfortunately, or well, it depends on how you look at it, but some of them don't migrate anymore. They used to fly back north to Canada, as their name might suggest, in the summer. But some of the residents have decided to stay. Living is easy here in the Great South Bay. So we see Canada geese all year round in our waters. And the goose on the right, from a distance, looks a lot like a Canada goose. You can see that it's a little bit different. It's a little shorter neck. Um, it's tough to pick them out. Lots of times they're in flocks together with Canada geese. And that is a Brant goose. And um, Brant geese, we see them more down at the western end of Fire Island. Um, where I've seen flocks of Brant geese, if you've ever gone to over the Robert Moses Causeway to the Fire Island Lighthouse along the roadway there, it's, I guess it's still Ocean Parkway there. Um, I've seen flocks of these in the median. So um, they, and they graze on grass. A lot of them graze on grass as well as sitting in the water and grazing on seaweed. So I'm just gonna, I need to, make a comment here about waterfowl and ducks and feeding them. So on the left, in the left picture, you see a mixed flock of, we see something that looks like a mallard maybe, we see some domestic ducks, the, uh, geese, sorry. So most of the geese in the picture on the left are domestic geese. The goose on the right is a Canada goose. And uh, if you notice, there's something wrong with its wings. So um, this is a condition that's called angel wing syndrome. The, the geese can no longer fly if their wings don't grow in straight. And they're much more susceptible to a predator like a fox or a raccoon grabbing them, especially when they're sitting on their nest. And this is caused from eating bread. So um, if, you, if no one's ever told you this before, it's a good lesson to learn and please share that bread is not good for ducks and geese. It contains no nutrients, they like it, but imagine feeding uh, your children white sugar. They like it, but it's not really good for them and they're not gonna grow very healthy. So um, I would discourage anybody from feeding bread, Cheerios, uh, stale bagels to, uh, to waterfowl, even seagulls because it fills their belly without giving them the nutrients they need. And so when we see a goose like this, we know that it's probably been living in a park um, or on a creek where people stop and, and, and throw bread at them. And a much better option is something like corn. You can probably buy it down at the feed store, whole corn. They like that just as well. And it's got more nutrition for them uh, than, than bread or, or other junk food junk food, we don't want, and in general, we suggest you don't feed the wildlife. Okay. Um, all right, if we drive over the bridge at Smith Point and we, we either go down to the marina um, or even in the parking lot, some of these are very, very commonly seen. So the three on the left are, are pretty recognizable as, we'll all call them seagulls, but, um, it looks like that's a ring-billed gull on the bottom picture. It's hard to tell exactly. It could be a herring gull, um, but that's an adult in that bottom left picture. The two top pictures are juveniles. So one of those challenging things about gulls is that it takes them three to four years to get their adult plumage. So before they get those snowy white feathers on their, on their head and chest, they're gonna go through sort of this brown modely phase. And juvenile birds are often colored in a more in a in a way that camouflages them better. So the brown might help them if they're sitting on the seaweed, if they're on their, you know, if they're still in the nest with their parents. 
And over the years, they will molt their feathers and grow in white feathers. So the far left is probably maybe a first year and the, the one on the right, second or third year, because it's got more white. And the one on the bottom is an adult. So when you see a bird that's sort of a, a seagull that's mottly brown, it's a juvenile of some species or another, and it's very often hard to tell. Um, the bird on the right is a double crested cormorant. These are very common. We see them standing on the jetty, um, sitting on dock pilings. They are mostly dark. The younger birds are paler underneath. They have an interesting sort of hook bill and the way they sit is a little different from any other kind of duck. Their, their legs are set on a little differently and that's because they're diving birds. So if you see cormorants sitting on the water, often they'll vanish in front of your eyes and that's because they're diving and they dive for fish. So um, I've seen them come out of the water, come up to the dock, throw the fish up in the air and drop it down their own throat. So um, they're, they're very, very successful uh, fisher birds and, and fairly common. Because they dive, their, their, their feathers are not waterproof. So here's a little test you can do. You can try this at home with your kids or just for fun. If you have a feather that you know is a gull feather or a duck feather, and you put it under the faucet, run water over it, the water beads up because there's an oil that's, that comes from their body, coats their feathers that makes them waterproof and helps them to remain buoyant. It traps air so that uh, ducks and gulls stay buoyant. Cormorants don't wanna be buoyant, they wanna dive. So their, their feathers are not waterproof. And lots of times you may see, I wish I had a photo here and I didn't put one on my presentation. They're up on a jetty or a rock with their wings out on the sides because they're drying off because they've, their feathers have become saturated and they need to dry off. So that, that's pretty interesting. So more interesting gulls. So this is, here are two gulls. Whenever we see a really big gull, we say, oh, that's a black backed gull. Um, the previous gulls were more gray, uh, sort of that slaty gray with the black wingtips. Uh, these have black, um, black, totally black feathers and they're very big. So the greater black backed gull is the one on the right. And if you notice, and this is something, if you're gonna do some bird watching, take a look at their legs now. So the greater black backed gull has pink legs. So they're very common. We see them summer and winter. But the bird on the left, if you notice, has yellow legs. And this is a, a gull from Iceland. And this is a lesser black backed gull. It's still a large gull, uh, maybe a little bit smaller than the greater black backed gull, but we can tell the local because he's got those pink legs while the Icelandic gull has yellow legs. And that's just, it's something when you observe a bird, if you, if you know it right away, you say, okay, that's a blue jay or that's a cardinal. But when you see a duck sometimes or sparrows, which are totally confusing, look for all the details. What color is the bill? What color are the legs? Because it's a very small, it's a very small detail that you have to look for in order to identify these birds. Okay, we have a flock of these over at Smith Point now. It, these are snow buntings. So snow buntings, when they're sitting, often look just like a sparrow. But when they fly, you can see these white patches on their wings. Um, these are Arctic birds that come to our... Um, our beaches, they like sort of open areas. And there is a flock of about 50 of them that have been on the traffic circle at, over the Smith Point Bridge. So if you're in the neighborhood and you drive over the bridge and around the traffic circle and you see a flock of small birds, those are probably the snow buntings that came from the Arctic. And I think that's really fascinating. So what else do we have? Okay, some birds of prey. 
Um, this is a marsh hawk or harrier. These are often seen flying over Fire Island. It's a medium sized hawk, which is, that's a really hard, that's a bad way to describe it. Not as big as an eagle, maybe twice the size of a pigeon. Okay, if that helps. Um, and sort of a rounded head, rounded wings and hawk behavior. You see them gliding, oh, they're hunting. So these, these hawks are eating, looking for mice, maybe frogs or snakes, whatever they can find. Um, but they're, they're um, flying low over the dunes. They're looking for uh, prey. And when they turn and bank, you can get to see the top of them. If you notice, it's got a white patch on the top. And that's really, really clear to see when you see this bird flying. So if you see a hawk-like bird flying around, sort of medium size, half, less than half the size of an eagle, um, it could very well be a marsh hawk, especially if you see that white patch. And there are other hawks we have. We have red tail hawks, which are, as described, they're, the top of their tail is red. They're bigger than this. Um, we have some falcons, which are, I don't even think I'm gonna talk about them because they're so hard to tell apart. But when we do our bird count, we're gonna count them all. Uh, when we go on the beach, you may see lots of shorebirds that look like this. They're the ones that run up and down. Most likely you're seeing a sanderling. Okay, these are the most common that we see in large flocks. If you look closely, you might see some that look a little different. So these birds are Dunlin. They're also fairly common. Let me go back. These are a little further away. It's harder to see them, but they're paler in color. When we see these darker shorebirds, the bill is very dark. Uh, so those are Dunlin. Um, and the one in the center is a ruddy turnstone and it's sort of reddish and it's, it's quite distinctively different. And this is the time when you get out your field guide and you say, oh, look, that bird has orange legs when all the other ones have black legs, what could it be? And this is, you have to remember your, your gist or your gist. What do we expect to see here? Well, certainly sanderlings, but this is not out of the question and, and fairly common. Um, and they're really fun to spot because they're different from the other shorebirds. Okay, here's the star of the show. The last couple of weeks, there's been a snowy owl right near our visitor center. We've had the spotting scope outside and sharing it with visitors. Um, it might be tough to see a snowy owl uh, because they're white. They are whiter than the sand. So the last few days when we had snow on the dunes, really tough to spot. Um, these are Arctic birds. They are having an eruption year or a near eruption year. So there's a lot of them around. We've seen as many as four on the stretch of beach from um, our visitor center at Smith Point down to the breach to the west. So we've seen four individuals at one time. So we know there's at least four um, walking along the beach, you have a great chance of seeing one if you're quiet and stay near the water and bring your binoculars because it's the whitest thing on the beach. Um, if you see something that looks like a Clorox bottle up or, a or a plastic bag that's white against the sand, take out your binoculars. It might be a snowy owl. And the um, male and female are slightly different here. Juveniles, like many younger birds, are darker. So the more brown speckling you see on the feathers, the younger that bird is. And the males become pure white. So uh, for you Harry Potter fans, Hedwig was probably a male. And probably the reason they chose a male snowy owl for Harry Potter was the males are smaller than the females. And in lots of species, this is true. The female is larger than the male. So here we have a, a great example. And this is one of, this is a really the showstopper. Everybody comes looking for the snowy owl. And I can safely say your chances of seeing it are very good. Stop at the ranger station to look through the scope. 
So the Great Backyard Bird Count is coming up um, this year. It's February 18th to the 21st. Um, the website is here. You can just Google Great Backyard Bird Count and find out how to participate. It's easy. You can do it as groups. We're going to talk a little bit about programs coming up. Um, this video didn't work, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so Fire Island National Seashore, we are participating as a group. Um, we're going to do a group bird count Sunday, February the 20th. We're starting at 8 a.m. Because the quieter it is, the fewer visitors that have walked through, the more likely we are to see the birds. So we're starting at 8. Uh, if you think you'd like to join us, you can call the number. Um, take a little note of it. You can. Uh, that's our email address. I do see those emails, so it'd be great to see. Uh, hi, I saw you on the um, on the library program, and we want to join the bird count. We're not really limiting the number of people that we're going to have, but it'd be fun to sort of do it as a group and see what we all see. With the more pairs of eyes we have looking, the better chance we have. Um, the website at the bottom, if you want to take note of that, or I can I can send it to the libraries and they can share with you. You can create a species list for Fire Island. You can create a checklist of your own to use. And it, um, you can search by mammals, amphibians, fish, or birds. So it's kind of fun to print that out. I'm gonna have those for everybody on uh, Sunday the 20th. Uh, but I hope you can come along. And I know Tara has some programs to talk about too. So I'm gonna turn off my, oh, first questions. Let me stop sharing. Um, any questions from anybody? I'm not that good. You have questions. <laughs> Those, I have a question about the snowy owls. I'm very sure. intrigued by them. Um, can you talk a little more? I might've missed what, what you might've said about this already. So I apologize, but okay. um, you said you have about four of them are, are they they're, family groups and do they travel together? Great question. They're all traveling as individuals now. So we've seen four sort of one after the other where one couldn't have moved and we saw it again. So that's how I came up with four. They are traveling as individuals at this time of year. Um, they mate and nest in the Arctic. So we won't see pairs of them here. They're not courting. They're not um, you know, creating nests, they're not pairing off, they're just hunting, they're just surviving the winter the best they can. And they, they do spread out. I, I can't tell you, you walk down the beach and see four birds. That was a very lucky day that mm -hmm. we saw four individuals. Um, the one that's near the visitor center, if it's the same one each time, and we don't know, uh, seems to be a female because it's got, uh, it's large and it's got the brown speckles. They do hunt at night, like most owls, but they rest during the day in the open. And this is what makes them sort of special and different. We do see them. We have great horned owls um, all over Long Island. And um, if you open your windows at night and you hear the hoo-hoo, that's the typical great horned owl, but very tough to see because they're nesting mostly in fir trees close to the trunk, really tough to see. Their feathers um, camouflage them very well. The thing about the snowy owl is they just sit. There's no tree that they hide in. Some of them sit on a log. Sometimes they sit just on the sand on top of a dune, they're resting. So resting snowy owls are, are not to be disturbed. And this is something else I should mention. Um, they, they need to hunt to survive. They are saving their energy, conserving their energy and resting during the day. If you get so close as to make a snowy owl fly and it has to fly and it's not hunting, you've pretty much taken a meal out of its mouth or out of its stomach. So we, we really encourage people to watch from a distance. Um, yes, birds fly, they fly away, but we try not to make them fly more than they really need to fly to hunt and to eat. So that's just a little word of, of, of caution and recommendation, but they, they are out there. And there's one that's been sitting on a tree 
right outside the visitor center, not right outside. It's probably uh, maybe 80 feet away, but with binoculars, really clear to see. So come and see it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Were there any other questions for Pat? Um, I see a couple things in the chat. Oh, no, yes, and thanks. Okay. Okay, and so um, I'll just take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what the library programs are. So Fire Island National Seashore has their program on Sunday. And let me just share the screen, uh, my screen, so that we can, I don't forget to tell you about certain things. So as Pat mentioned, um, Great Backyard Bird Count is uh, Friday through Monday, February 18th through the 21st. And we're very happy um, at the library to have some programs to share with you. Um, there we go. So first up on Saturday, February 19th from 12 to one, our children's uh, department is hosting a program at the Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge. And this is for families with at least one child in grade seven or younger. And you can go and meet up and Miss Hillary will have lists of birds, um, some fun bird packets, and you can walk around the refuge uh, spotting birds and keeping count of what you see so that we can all be citizen scientists together. In addition, um, for the adults and the rest of the community, um, we have created a great backyard bird count packet that you can stop by the library and pick up and take home so that you can go birding in your own favorite place, whether that is your backyard, down the street, down at the beach, whenever you have 15 minutes, that's all it takes, just 15 minutes. And in the packet, you're going to see what, how to participate. It gives you some resources for identifying birds because um, we don't all know them. <laughs> um, and then there are tally sheets and there are multiple tally sheets if you wanna do this once or four times each day, however many times um, you wanna do it. And as Pat has already mentioned, there are some really great resources. And of course, first we have you know, all the books at the library, feel free to come by and, and pick up um, some resources there. You can also visit the Great Backyard Bird Count website at birdcount.org. And you can download some apps to help you identify birds. Um, Merlin Bird ID by Cornell Labs is a great app for identifying birds by, by sight, by color, by sound. You can find out what the sound is. That's always fun. And, and by region, uh, you can download different regions of the United States, depending on where you are, and, and see what birds are local to that area. And then if you wanted to take on uh, the birding list yourself for the Great Yard Backyard Bird Count, you can also download the eBird app and enter your birds that way. So yeah, we just have a few, a few programs. So that's, that's it for my little presentation there. And I saw in the chat that Gary raised his hand. Did you have a question, Gary, for us? You can unmute yourself if you'd like, and then you can ask your question. Okay. All right, well, that's okay. Um, and then one last thing, I wanted to invite you to our next um, event with the Fire Island National Seashore Park Rangers. That will be um, next month on Wednesday, March 9th at seven o'clock. We will be talking all about piping plovers, those very cute little birds that we saw in the beginning of the presentation. Um, you can okay. register. You can register for that program at communitylibrary.org slash programs, or, or of course, give us a call and uh, we can get you registered for that. But I see that Gary has unmuted himself. So if he did have a question. Well, I still trying to figure out Gary's <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. We have a number of bird feeders outside and we've been familiar to, it looks like we have chickadees. I don't even know if I'm identifying them correctly. I'm wondering, is there a specific food that would attract different birds, what's the best thing we should be putting in the feeder? And you don't have to put bread. Because <laughs> I paid attention. So that, that's my question. 
I can address that. Um, there are birds that prefer different kinds of seeds based on how their beaks are built. So I mm. know there's uh, specific uh, birds that like thistle seeds and you can buy bags of thistle seeds and you hang the bag up and they eat it right through the, um, through the fabric of the bag. But in general, most um, places where you'd buy bird seed, look at the bag and look at the pictures on the bag and that'll tell you what kind of birds you'll attract. It's sort of like general backyard bird seed is good for everybody. It's got some smaller seeds, it's got sunflower seeds. Um, so I, if I would say ask at the, the, the pet shop or wherever you're buying your seed, if they would recommend something or look at the picture on the bag and whatever no, I mean, birds you have. Oh, a wide variety, but I didn't know if you were, but I didn't know about the fiscal bag. So thank you about that. Sure. You have anything to add to that here? Okay. Okay, no more questions? All right, I hope to see everybody on March 9th. Because <laughs> I'll be back. Oh, um, very good. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Um, stop by the library for any of those other programs or to pick up your, your bird counting packet and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Pat, for those great presentation. Oh, thanks for coming. Good night now. Good night, everyone.